Inanimate Bodies and the Soil in the Art of Isabel Ruiz and Edgar Kalel. 1. El silencio perdió su trayectoria frente a una mano que abre las puertas a la voz. This is a poem by Francisco Morales to be found in the first pages of Guatemala Memory of Silence, the report of the Commission for Historical Clarification that was created in the context of the peace treaties of the early 90s and had the task to research and publish on crimes of war as well as human rights violations during their internal armed conflict in Guatemala, a conflict that lasted 36 years and left around 200,000 dead and 45,000 disappeared. It is in this report that the genocidal character of the state is unequivocally stated. The Mayan communities being marked as state enemies and thus the larger the target of counterinsurgency. A couple of years later, another investigation was published, coordinated by Bishop Juan Gerardi, and that ultimately cost him his life, Guatemala Nunca Más. On its cover, we can see part of a photographic series by Daniel Hernández. The feathered human figure at the center is opening his mouth with a strong gesture. Both the poem and the cover asks readers to listen to the voices gathered in the form of oral testimonies, the main research material of both uh, reports. And they also urge them, they urge us, to speak up. However, I don't want to talk about Hernández nor about Morales, but about the late latter's wife, artist Isabel Ruiz, who passed away two years ago. And particularly, I want to talk about her installation Historia Sitiada from the early 90s. These are very bad images of the, of the installation. This one has been cre recreated since then in several locations, and here are pictures of um, some of the first installations. Uh, now here is a, a better image from uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santa Barbara in 2017. Gathered around a triptychon, a three parts non-figurative red and black painting that lays on the floor, ten burnt chairs stand facing each other with burning candles on their seats and onto a carpet of coal. Maybe there are even some ashes from the burned up chairs. The mortuary atmosphere is not only created through the melting candles and the shape and position of the painting. Is it a cross? Is it a coffin? According to the artist herself during an interview, once it was shown inside some ruins in Antigua Guatemala, most probably of a church, the sacred space unexpectedly invited visitors to really enter a mourning space. That is, a space where the dead and the living relate to each other through spiritual or ritual practices. But while it is through fire that the dead are evoked and the process of mourning made possible, It is also through fire that materialities are transformed so as to become unrecognizable, that is, unreadable. This is a video from the installation of the piece in Guatemala in 2017. Is it possible to read the remaining ashes? And who is doing the reading? The mourners, of course, but also all others who may encounter the art installation, listening to the artists denounce of the brutality of the Guatemalan genocide. These are methodological and they are ethico-political questions. According to the report in Guatemala Nunca Más, the capacity of fire to make things unreadable was employed explicitly by the Guatemalan army, for instance burning the bodies of hundreds of victims that were gathered in mass graves. They should never be recognized again. In what is known as a tactic of scorched earth, they even burned whole villages, forcing the inhabitants to flee and occupying their territories after they had gone. Isabel Ruiz accompanied the research and publication of both the reports um, closely. 
they build the context for the installation Historia Sitiada. 2. In 2014, Edgar Kalel's grandmother passed away in the Maya Cacchiquel town of Chichot, also known as San Juan Comalapa in Guatemala. During that time, he was staying in a residence in Sao Paulo, so he asked his family not to touch anything in the house where she lived, to leave it as it was. Once he returned, he decided to paint the phonem Kit 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 all over the facade's wall, walls. He did so with dumped earth. This is a sound his grandmother used to sing while gathering birds that would walk and fly to her house's backyard in order to eat what she had to give them. I know from others that this is a common praxis, uh, practice and sound in my Chiquel towns. Kalels is a complex operation to evoke his grandmother's memory through a sound that is transformed into words painting with written words, painted with earth gathered from the house's interior onto its walls. He later even painted the house on canvas. The painted house on canvas. In contrast to the ashes, here we can actually read the sound, but he, we could also listen to it, sang, from, for instance, by the artist himself. Kit 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 Because of being the carrier of multiple meanings and uses, earth has been used by many contemporary artists as material in art, also ashes. But now look, let's look at the specific uses as well as meanings within what Maya Emma Shirix would comprehensively call Mayan ways of thinking and doing. And I am following her here because it is her who speaks of the body as a method and the framework of, for instance, territoriality. Lorena Capnal and other feministas comunitarias even speak of the territory as an especially female body and of the body as territory, both in terms of the colonial and patriarchal violence committed onto them, as well as of the necessity and importance to defend particular bodies, territories, that are singular as they are collective. We have seen how the tactic of scorched earth was meant to impact on indigenous understandings, but also on indigenous of territoriality, but also on indigenous territories specifically. Earth can and indeed is also used as material and a structuring element in Mayan architectural techniques, the house itself being described through an intimate analogy with the human body, something Aurelio Sanchez Suarez and others have, have dealt with through the etymology of, process, of processes and parts of the house, an earthly body that becomes animated when it is inhabited, the house. As soil, earth has the capacity to nurture life of plants and consequently of people. But soil itself is also full of life and it needs to be nurtured. In Mayan notions of becoming human, maize and other crops are central, such as the case of the creation of humans out of maize in the Maya Quiche sacred book of the Popol Vuh. This process has also served as a metaphor in contrasting ways, for example, with counterinsurgency tactics targeted at children, the quote unquote seeds of insurgency. Emma Chirish revives the metaphor when speaking of the seeds of liberation planted in indigenous youth while practicing collective resistance against deprivation in Western educational systems. As seeds, people come from the earth and they return to it once passed away. This earthly relation, activated through practices such as the burial of the navels from the newborn and of course rituals of burial, keeps being central for Mayan ways of becoming, and here I follow Arpe Jimenez, uh, becoming rather than being peoples, meaning also to become collective. 
When dealing with what has been called the Mayan movement since the 1990s, Diane Nelson talks about becoming Mayan through various operations. So beyond serving as projection surface for, let's say, one's own origin or belonging, this would imply stasis, unchangeability, the living soil as well as its inhabitants maintain an active relation with the living, a relation of reciprocity, otherwise referred to uh, in the context of the principle of complementarity, a debated term, no doubt. I am talking about a relation with the ancestors. 3. Consulting different actors and also authors, it becomes clear that ancestrality is not a given but the product of the work of mourning and an active relation between the living and the dead in Mayan contexts. Petra Petrich even speaks of becoming an ancestor through the preservation of reliquaries and the calling out of names in festivities and in rituals. It is precisely here that the question of how to die becomes crucial, meaning both the conditions of dying as well as the mourning process that may already begin before the person's passing away. And even this question, when does one finally pass away, differs significantly from Western understandings of animatedness. It doesn't really seem to be relevant that the body becomes inanimate whatsoever. It, it doesn't, right? Fernando Suazo, for example, talks about the active relation with the corpses before their burial as one between subjects in the Achi area. As in many other contexts, burial lays at the center of mourning, the moment where the whole body, and this is important, the preservation of the body's wholeness, is integrated into the earth and begins a journey to the realm of the dead, not abandoning, but transforming its relations to the living, as we have seen. And it is interesting to think about this process as one of also giving life in terms of nutrients, etc., to the soil, as Maria Pucci de la Bella Casa has suggested from a very different uh, place. In other words, the dead have a life, they give life to the soil and to those living. And here is where the anti-epistemological violence of military counterinsurgency laid. The disappearance, burning and also the mutilation and thus fragmentation of whole bodies into parts not only had an impact in economic and social terms, but they massively disturbed the relation of the living and the dead, between the living and the dead the possibility of their proper remembrance and thus of a good life for generations to come. Petrich speaks of the anxiety of some communities that lost so many people before their time had come, profoundly troubling their passage towards becoming ancestors. But she also speaks about the creativity of rituals that, through speech, reintegrate those who died badly into the realm of ancestrality. Here I am reminded of Vena Das, who speaks about the acoustic dimension of mourning work in specific contexts in India, if the, of the importance of transforming silence into laments, especially in the context of what she also names bad dyings. Interestingly, she also used this terminology. Now the families of the badly killed during the genocide also pursue the fight against oblivion and for justice. Besides demanding reparations and the persecution of human rights violations in court, they likewise reclaim the bodies of their dead and even search for them themselves. Nelson beautifully describes the work of the Fundación de Antropología Forense, the Forensic Anthropology Foundation, who tirelessly exhume bones and other rests from clandestine mass graves and identify their families via DNA technology. This is a very concrete way of reading bones, that is, of decoding information from them with the help of a sign system, that is, in this case, DNA. But here lays a paradox, a tension between Mayan mourning practices and Western science systems. Again, according to Emma Chirish, who, by the way, does not dismiss the importance of the identification of, of, 
of corpses. The forenses and other NGOs have dealt with bones in an objectifying ray, way, disrespecting the fact that, quote, the buried bodies have a life, end quote. And later she says, quote, our bodies have a life and they matter to us, end of quote. And it is this highly complex understanding of liveness that lays at the core of indigenous resistance in, in Emma Chirish's uh, text. So the necessity of materialization in mourning, as well as the creativity of Mayan mourning practices in the immediate aftermath of genocide, offers an explanation to the ways in which Isabel Ruiz's installation in Storia Sitiada really became a mourning site when exhibited in Antigua Guatemala in, in the ruins, not in Santa Barbara, I would say. For its part, the intimate and multidimensional relation between the body and the earth within Mayan ways of living and dying serves as a link between acts seemingly so distant as the passing away of Edgar Calel's grandmother, a phoneme written on a wall, and the use of earth as writing material in art. It becomes clear that these are representational art practices, these are not representational art practices, for instance, of a specific massacre in the case of Ruiz and of the history of Kalel's grandmother passing. Nor are they describable solely within the boundaries of contemporary arts language, but that would be another topic. What these artists do are acts of material, semiotic and affect affective transformation of earth into words through water, of wood into coal through fire, of the dead into a living presence through sound. But how to read a sound or an affect without a clear sign system, itself a system of representation, necessarily? Contrary to Nelson's engagements with reading bones through DNA, Mario Aguilar has dealt with the possibility of a hermeneutic of bones in terms of revealing, revealing messages from God, and this is Herm's uh, task in uh, Greek mythology, to transmit and thus interpret messages from the gods. Moreover, how to do this, how to read, in ways and media that are not so clear, like the very materiality and presence of unburied bones in Rwandan churches after the genocide. How is hermeneutics possible there? That's his question. Relating to the bones through silent practices, the families of victims, or in the words of Aguilar, the poor and the oppressed, and he comes from theology of liberation. So the families of the victims become the readers of God's message of love and liberation. In a way, silence becomes the condition for such reading. And by reading, I mean now both interpreting and understanding. I will not speculate about what the materiality of ashes or of earth may have um, meant to those who encounter these art practices in situ. I anyway couldn't. But what I indeed see myself confronted with, and I want to formulate this as an open question, is a methodological challenge, that is, to encounter both an installation and a mourning space, an artistic intervention and an animated house or an ancestral sound. It is a tension that is both grounded, and this is again a uh, usage of, a, of an earthly metaphor, grounded in history and space, and it is a tension relevant for many attempts to deal with art praxis in a different, let's say now, decolonial um, way. If in mourning, Remaining silent is necessary in order to engage with matter. Silencing has also been a genocidal tactic. Bodies were made unburiable, memories unsayable, and this is a way of perpetuating bad dying and, as we have seen, consequently, bad living. In other words, and this applied also for those of us who write and who take the word, as I am doing right now, we need to respect silence and simultaneously to speak up against oblivion. But maybe silence and speech, reading and listening, are not as mutually exclusive as we may think of them. 
and it would be in this division that lies the first error. Here, I just shortly want to hint to Tina Kamp's Listening to Images, a book where she writes towards a methodology for what only seems to be paradoxical but actually isn't necessarily. I am referring to the very title, right? Listening to Images. Interestingly, she does so, does so departing from a memory of mourning, listening to the hum of her father when her mother passed away, a quiet hum that spoke of the depths of loss and likewise of the unsayability, quote, of words, end quote. I need to come to an end, not without insisting that in Guatemala, as in many other places, critical legacies urge us to speak, to speak up. The how, how to speak, is up to us. Thank you.